Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just give, I give you glory and I give you honor. God, I worship and adore you, Father. We just thank you so much for your presence in this place. For surely you are in the midst of your people. And God, I thank you right now. No flesh, no flesh, no flesh, no flesh. In the name of Jesus, I bow down and submit to your authority, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. And I'm so grateful, Lord God, that you would make me meet for your use. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege and it's an honor, Lord God. And I bless you for this house. I thank you, God, for the shepherd of this house, the angel of this house. God, I thank you, God, for his heart to worship you, God, unashamed and uninhibited. God, I thank you, Lord God, that he loves you and he loves your people. I thank you that he is a man of integrity and honesty. I thank you that he is a man who knows how to break the bread of life. I thank you that he is a man that rightfully, oh God, divides the word of God. I thank you. I thank you, oh Lord God, that he is a truth teller and a truth revealer. I thank you that that he is an educator and a covering, Lord God. I thank you, God, in the name of Jesus, that he is a friend and a brother to me, God. Lord, I thank you right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I bless you for this, this 14th anniversary. I thank you for the woman of God who walks by his side and takes care of him in sickness and in health, good, bad, up, down, low, high, all in between. Lord God, I thank you in the name of Jesus that she is just like your son who would never leave him or forsake the man of God. I thank you. Lord God, we bless you for this house fully relying on God. We thank you, God, for the leaders of this house who have risen up. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus and going forth in power and authority, I thank you, Lord God, for their servanthood, for their love, for their pastor, their submission to him. They are an example to the young people. God, I thank you for the servants in the back, in the front, the side. God, I thank you for those who are to come in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for the impartation that is to come, oh God, from new beginnings outreach, oh God. There is an impartation coming to this house in Jesus' name. Bless you, Jesus. We thank you for already having your way in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. And I would be remiss if I didn't follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, you got to be careful when you're in service because God speaks before somebody gets up here with a Bible in their hand. I know you hear God. I know you hear God. God talks to us through the Psalms. God speaks to us in the worship. He speaks to us in the announcements. In the announcements, and uh, sister, I heard the Lord speak to me concerning you. And if you would just allow me, in the name of Jesus, to walk in the name of Jesus and to speak according to His purpose and His plan. Thank you, Lord. Thank I will blow your mind. I will blow your mind. I will cause things to come into your life that you have never dreamed of, that you have never even thought of. If you will just do for me, Monday through Saturday, what you do on Sunday, oh my God, he will bless you. Because I heard the Lord say that when you get up here on Sunday, you're not playing around. There's something that happens to you yes. when you come into this place, when you get that microphone in your hand, when you stand next to this man of God, when you sing glory and hymns unto Jesus Christ, there's something that's going on on the inside of you. And he said it is not just for one day a week, but if you'll just yield, if you'll just yield, if you'll just yield, if you'll just put down those things Monday through Saturday, he said, I will blow your mind, said the Lord. I will use you. I can use you. You're not too dirty. It's not too late. You're not too filthy. Haven't sinned too much. You haven't disappointed him. He hasn't changed his mind about you. Oh my God. He said he'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Lift your hands and tell him I surrender. Tell him. Tell him. I surrender. I bind every hindering spirit in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus upon her right now. I plead the blood. I plead the blood upon her mind right now. And declare that every fiery dark that the enemy is shooting on the back of your mind. Telling you that you're not worthy. That you're not worth it. 
God, I plead the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against him. The blood of Jesus, the blood, the blood. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the spirit of the living God. Thank you, thank you. Those children that were in the back, those children, those children. I know this is God, I know this is God. Those children right there in the back. I don't know who brought you here, but whoever brought you here, God said, this is exactly where you are, y'all right there. This is exactly where you're supposed to be. And if whoever brought you here will keep bringing you here, God will raise y'all up to do a mighty work in the kingdom of God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. He wants to use you. He's going to use you. all He's going to use you all. This is where you're supposed to be. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. I take no credit. I, this is God. This is not chin. This is not the work of a woman. Hallelujah. Bless God. There is a word from the Lord. Hebrews chapter 6. Praise God. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. 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 There is a word from the, ah, oh, bless Jesus. Bless Jesus. Bless God. And just like you got up, you coming up out of all that other stuff. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 6. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to start off at verse 9. I'm going to back up a little bit and show you what the Lord gave me to speak about. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to read from the King James, and the Lord gave me to talk to you today, saints of God, beloved of his children, not only from the King James, but he wants us to understand even from another version, the New Living Translation. Praise God. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 20. But beloved, we'll bless you. We are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Though we thus speak, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints, and you do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. But when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying... Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, somebody say patiently endured, he obtained the promise. <laughs> he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willingly, more abundantly, to show unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us, entered even Jesus, made an high priest, forever after the order of Melchizedek. Ha! Huh. And the scripture focus today is verse 15. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So to back it up, Paul, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let's, let's where we started off in verse 9, uh, and, and that's where I started. He said, but beloved, we're persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. And so what is Paul saying? In chapter five, he had talked about, he said, you believers, he talked about the spiritual growth, telling them that some of the things uh, that were difficult for him to explain to them because they were still on me. He said, some things you won't understand because you're on milk. Some things I can't explain to you because you're not mature enough. He says, some things I can't tell you because you won't understand because you're still on milk. And he says, by now you ought to be teachers, but I can't explain these things. He goes on to say that those who are immature in Christ don't know how to do what's right. Oh my God, that solid food is for those who are mature through training and through skill. 
to recognize the right and the wrong. So he says in chapter six, is stop. He said, I'm not going to keep going over the basic things of salvation and laying on of hands and the baptisms and the repent and the resurrection of the dead, right? Eternal judgment. He says, I'm going to move forward. And so this is what he says in verse nine, where I started. Dear friends, even though I'm talking this way, I really don't believe it applies to you. Okay. We're confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with the salvation. Are you hearing the Lord? Amen. So verse 10, for God is not just. He'll not forget how hard you have worked. He said he hasn't forgotten how you love his people. He hasn't forgotten how you continue to love his people, continue to train up his people. And so after you patiently endure, you will obtain the promise. But he said our great desires in verse 11, let's just walk through this thing for a minute. Chapter 6 and verse 11, he said, we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. What's he saying? He said, our great desire is that you'll keep on loving others, that you'll keep on doing what you're doing, because after you patiently endure, you will inherit the promise. Keep doing what you're doing, says the Lord. I know this is a rainbow word. Keep doing what you're doing, pastor, and you will inherit the promise. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherited the promise. So what is he saying? He said that you'll become spiritually dull if you're indifferent. But if you follow the faith of Abraham, right? Just like Abraham endured the promise, endured patiently, Abraham got the promise. We know he was old when God gave him the promise of the son. Read your Bibles. We know that his wife was 90 years old when she had a baby. And I just come to encourage somebody today that if God made you a promise, he is sure enough to bring it to pass. All you got to do is patiently endure. He's not a man that he should lie. Neither is a son of man that he should repent. Praise God. I come to encourage somebody today. I don't know about you, but God has made me some promises that I haven't seen manifest yet. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Oh, my God. So, for example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no bond one greater, he swore by himself. Now, I don't know about you, but when I didn't know better, when I was growing up, we would say, I swear on my mother. I swear to God. I swear on my daddy's grave. And right, we would swear on something, right, that was greater, that we perceived to be greater than ourselves. So we would never take it to ourselves and say, I swear by Linda. Right? Because the oath was taken by somebody or in the name of somebody who was perceived to be greater than yourself. So he swore by his own name. Who in the na who in the world would swear by somebody's name that's not worthy to be sworn by? He swore and he swore by his own name. So we shouldn't even desire to be given a greater promise. Don't even desire for somebody to promise you greater than that what God promised you in his own name. I love my bishop, but he can't promise me nothing that I, listen, that he can't promise me anything that I'm going to believe in like I believe in the promise God gave me. Oh, y'all know that's why you don't tell your kids, so you, you don't tell your kids some stuff because you might break your promise. You don't tell your kids certain things because they worry you to death, right? Because you don't want to keep paying, oh, are we going, are we going, are we still going, are we going, are we going, are we going? That's how we do God. You still got what? We, we're still good, right? You still going to do it, right? I ain't seen nothing yet, Jesus. I ain't heard nothing yet. Don't feel nothing yet. You still going to do it, still going to do it, still going to do it. <laughs> Praise God. Verse 14, he says, sure, he says, saying, surely blessing, I will bless thee and multiply and I'll multiply thee. What's he saying? He says, I'm going to increase you. He said, absolutely. Oh, my God, that's a word. Absolutely, I'm going to increase you fully rely on God. Surely, I'm going to increase you. Absolutely, I'm going to do it. Oh, my God. Surely, I will bring you to fullness. That's what that multiplying is. I'll bring you to fullness. Listen, I, I don't mind somebody adding a dollar. I, look, I don't mind if you give me a dollar. I don't mind if you add one plus one, but I like my dollars multiplied. I mean, that, that's what ROI is about. That's what investments are about. Not spending, but investments because you get a return on your investment. In other words, you put in 10, five years later, I got about 150 million 10. You understand what I'm saying? Multiplying, he will multiply you, woman of God. Praise God. Praise God. Verse 15, and so after, 
He had patiently endured. He obtained the promise. Not before. Oh, after. After. Not after you patiently endure. Not after you go, God, you said you was going to do it. Not after you whine. Not after you, well, Jesus, when you going to do it. Not after you're talking to him in your pride. But after we patiently, oh, my God, we're going to bring it down. We got to patiently, oh, my God. So that means you really got to do two things. Patiently enduring is not doing one thing. You got to be patient and you have to endure. That's right. That's right. And so after, he said, not before, so after you stay under submission, right. after you stay under subjection, after you remain humble for a time, after you continue believing, oh my God, after you abide, after you suffer for a while, yeah. after you tarry, you know the old folks would say you got to tarry at the altar. See, it's after all of that, after you have suffered for a while, after you have endured, after you have stayed in me, after you have stayed in my word, after you continue to worship me in the good times and the bad times, after you you keep praying unto me. Oh my God. Yeah. It's after that. Yeah. I don't know about y'all, but I have fallen off the wagon from time. Oh, I'm not going to play with y'all today. I'm being real. God has made this woman a God to promise. And every time I feel like I'm getting close and it looks like I'm getting close, you ever go get somewhere on the highway and you know your exit is 29 and you're about exit 18 and then all of a sudden traffic backs up. Oh my God. And then you then you see the here you see the, all the sirens coming. You think I ain't never gonna get there. You start giving up around exit 18, you stop mealy mouthing, you stop complaining about what's going on along the way. All you're tapping your foot and you're humming and you're and you're doing all like this, and so now you're no longer patiently. So go back and start all over, Linda. Go back. <laughs> Go back. You're going to get the promise after you patiently endure. Thank you, Jesus. You got to remain and stay under subjection. You got to remain under the authority of the man of God, like it or not. Keep your mouth closed. Get on your knees. Praise God. After. After you stay under, not for a week, not for two weeks, because God know when you're going to flip, flop, change your mind. Oh, my God, when you're going to walk with me up one day and down the next day, he knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. So Abraham waited patiently, and he received the promise of God. I just come to encourage somebody. Your promise is coming. Your promise is coming, but you got to patiently endure Hallelujah. Verse 16. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Right. So by the very nature of an oath, which is a declaration, it's a vow, it's a pledge, it's a solemn promise made, oh, my God, in the in the front of witnesses by one greater than yourself. And that is why they have, I don't care what people say about this is no longer a nation under God. You better believe they still put their hands on the Bible when they take a vow. They ain't all the way crazy. Amen, somebody. So they take a vow and they swear and they take an oath. They take an oath. They say, I'm pledging to do this. Even if you join the military, you make a pledge to defend your nation. I mean, even the Girl Scouts have a pledge for crying out loud. Amen, somebody. Praise God. So, it, and, and this pledge is what you're saying. When you take an oath, you are saying that I promise to do something and act in a certain way. I, I promise that I'm going to behave in a certain fashion. So when you gave your life to Christ and you accepted his son as your personal savior and Lord of your life, you promised him, Jesus, I'm going to act a certain way. Oh, Jesus, I'm going to behave a certain way. Now, everybody know, you know, yeah, we're not perfect. We're going to have some stumble bumps along the way. Thank God for grace and this dispensation of grace. Praise God. That's why Jesus died on the cross for us. But you still got to do something. You can't keep coming to church and, and just come on Sunday and Bible study or no Bible study and you act the same way. Oh, my God. Like you never got saved before. God is watching. He is watching. And you wonder why your promise don't come into manifestation? Bless God. Bless God. Because we're not patiently enduring. And to endure is to stick with it. Stick with Jesus. Stick with Jesus. I don't care what the crowd says. I don't care who's smoking weed. I don't care who's going to happy hour. I don't care who's cussing like a sailor. I don't care who's dropping it like this. I don't care who's wearing it short and tight. I don't care who's, who's drinking liquor. Oh, my God. All days. And coming in and acting like you've been saved all week. Stick with Jesus. 
in season and out. Now, I don't quite know what that means because Jesus ain't never been out of season for me. But I, 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 I amen. Amen. So he swore by none greater than himself. Hallelujah. So if you promise somebody something, that means your reputation is on the line. Right? His own reputation is on the line. He's saying, I swear by myself. So in other words, if I don't do it, then I'm a liar. And how can somebody who is the truth be a liar? Oh, God, who is be a liar? Verse 17, we're in God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, my God, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. What's all that saying? Okay, let me help you here. So God says, also bound by himself, he ratified to the heirs of promise. I don't know about you, but I'm an heir of promise. Yeah. I got some relatives who say they're going to leave me something when they die. But I'm going to tell you all something. This is funny to me. But my mom had told me all along where her will was, and she had handwritten it. She had told me years and years in the 70s and 80s. And when she passed, I left the hospital, and I told my brothers and sisters, I'll meet you at one of my brother's house. I'm going to go get the letter so that we understand what mom would have us to do. Because there were other things in there to do concerning her body. Well, in the letter, she had left us certain things, right, that she had. And she left to my older sister. She said, I leave to my older sister's name, my full length meek in my hat. And if I don't have it, if it's not there, oh, well, I sold it. And, we, and she had. Right? You understand what I'm saying? So we're heirs of promise as it relates to Jesus. You can rush to show him where he promised you that you're going to get an heir. You're going to get it. He ain't sold it. He ain't gave it away. He hasn't given it to anybody else. Bless God. Hallelujah. Heirs of promise. I'm an heir. I inherit a promise. It is mine. I inherit this promise. Mm. And so God, he says, also bound himself with an oath so that those who receive the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. That's what immutability means. It means he has never changed. He'll never change his mind about you. He has never changed his mind. It doesn't matter if you act crazy. He still hasn't changed his mind about you. He still loves you with an everlasting love. He still has thoughts of you beyond what you would believe. He still knows the plans that he has towards you. You're still his beloved. You're still the apple of his eye. You're still made in his image and after his likeness. He's still your everlasting father. He's still your counselor. He's still your priest. Hallelujah. He hasn't changed his mind about you. Praise God. But you still got to do your part. Still got to do your part. So he ratified. He ratified it. He confirmed it by his own oath. He intercedes. He said, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. So even when I go backwards and I know God promised me and I'm acting like, oh, Jesus, let me just make it plain. So if God promised you, that one of your children is, would come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Or that your body would be healed. Or that your husband would act right. Or your wife would act right. And then for 10 months they're acting right. And then on the 11th month they're going to do something crazy. Wow. That does not mean you don't patiently endure. You don't let your emotions be driven by somebody else's behavior. When you do that, you are giving them control over a part of your soul. Your soul consists of your mind and your will, in other words, your choices and your emotions. And so when you let somebody else drive your emotions, you're letting them control you. That's somebody's word. You don't own me. Love you, but you don't own me. Jesus bought me with, with his own blood. Praise God. Praise God. He bought me. He owns me. Hallelujah. So verse 18 says, and by two immutable, we said that's unchangeable things, by two, not one, but two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay upon, or lay hold upon the hope set before us. And so people say there's nothing impossible for God. It is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for him to lie. Praise God. Thank you. And so these two immutable things are, were his promise and his oath. Those two things that he will never change about you and toward you are his promise for you and the oath that he made you. Even if you were a child and you believe you heard God said something, he hasn't changed his mind. Praise God. He hasn't changed his mind. 
Thank you, Jesus. And so that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, right? We're sharers of this promise, and we got to have a strong consolation, not, a, not one that's just wavering and waffling. You know what I'm saying? You've got to have a strong consolation. And if you're in and out of church, if you're in and out of the will of God, if you're, if you're up one day and down the next, if you're humble one day and prideful for another, prideful another, you're up and down and you're wishy-washy, and that's not pleasing to God. So until you get and I get mature enough, oh my God, until we're able to act like adults in Christ, we cannot have this solid consolation because children are consoled but for a moment. But for a moment. Adults are consoled. They may go through some things, but at some point you get consoled. I needed consolation when I lost my mother, but I knew she was what with Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? Ooh. So we share of his promise as an inheritor of his promises and know that he's unchangeable and have this strong consolation in him. Bless God. Bless God. Thank you, Jesus. It's impossible for him to lie. So have you ever gotten, and, and this is a thing where we don't have this strong consolation. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever gotten so discouraged well, you just wanted to quit. Have you ever, I, I, listen, nobody playing today. Have you ever gotten so discouraged in your marriage you wanted to walk out? Let's tell the truth. You ever got so mad at your kids you wanted to put them out? You ever got so mad right in church you wanted to leave the church? You ever got so mad at your job you wanted to quit your job? Oh, y'all understand what I'm saying today. But we have to have a strong consolation and a strong constitution. And I thank God for it. So, oh my God. See, this is what we want to do. The Bible tells us that the old man is passed away and behold, all things become new. But what we want to do when we lose hope and when we get frustrated, when we get disgusted, what we want to do is we want to resurrect that old man that passed away. We want to dig him up out the grave, right? And, and some people call it laying down their religion. We want to dig him out the grave. Now watch this. You get weak. You want to dig him out the grave and go back to the strip club. You want to go back to smoke the weed. You want to go back to the lip. Oh, y'all know. You want to go back to the liquor bottle. You want to go back to line. You want to go back to the whorehouse. You want to go back to your friends and then hanging out and all of that because that's what made your flesh feel good. Yeah. But then you start all over again waiting on your promise. You set yourself back. He hasn't forgotten and he hasn't changed his mind. You just have to take the test over again. You just do retakes and retakes and retakes and retakes. And I don't know about you, but we were coming up in school. We used to call them kind of people challenged. <laughs> Doing the same grade over and over and over. You 25 years old in the seventh grade. Something wrong with that. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. When you going to figure it out that God ain't changed his mind. And God will outweigh you any day. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so he says, well, exactly. This is what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to throw in the towel. He wants you to go back and get drunk. He wants you to go right back to the muck and the mire that God pulled you out of. He wants you to do that. That's just, he's almost like Matias. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Go back into all those places. And it feels good but for a moment. And then you sober up. And then you look up and you are here I am again. How long, God? How long? So instead, what you have to do is you got to make yourself a refuge in God. Verse, and this is what he says in verse 18. He said, but those, he said that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And so you go back to the refuge. Psalm 91, 1 and 2, right? What does it say? He who abides in the secret place of the Almighty, right? Oh my God, thank you, Jesus. He who dwells in the secret place of the Almighty abides under the shadow, God. Thank you, Jesus. And I'll say of the Lord in verse 2, he is my refuge, my fortress. He's my refuge, my fortress, and my God. In him I will trust. Not in the liquor bottle that made me feel good for a minute. Not in my girlfriend or not in the boyfriend I laid down with. And he let me put my head on his chest. Of course he did. You just gave him the milk and cookies.
Your refuge is in Christ. And it's, I want to say it right. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. And so he's a hiding place for you. You can hide under the shadow of the Almighty. Ain't no shame in hiding in Jesus. Ain't no shame in retreating in Jesus. Ain't no shame in going back and sitting somewhere with the Lord. No, I can't go out tonight. No, I can't do that today. I need to be in Jesus. Go ahead, backstab me, talk about me, gossip about me. You can say anything you want, but I'm hiding. I'm in my refuge. I'm with my fortress. I'm with God who was covering me in the midst of the storm. Well, I can't neck up my mind. I'm getting ready to hide in Jesus. If I'm weak in my flesh, listen, I camp out at the church door. Camp out here. Praise God. He allows you to hide yourself in him until you can get your mind right. I don't know about you, but when your attitude goes south, when your promise is seemingly delayed, you get a funky attitude sometime, and you're just waiting. You know, I thought she said she was coming at 2 o'clock. Listen, God ain't like us. God is not like us. Time means nothing to God. He created it. So he allows you to hide yourself until you can get your mind right, until I can gain my composure back. Look, let me get myself back together again. Let me go hide in Jesus right now until I can get my mind together so that I can refrain from resurrecting that old past away, Linda, so that I can get my attitude right, so I can decide that I'm going to act like I got some sense so I can stop delaying obtaining my promise. Anybody tired of waiting on their promise? Patiently endure. Hold on, boo. Hold on. Hold on. And while I'm waiting, you've got to decide. You've got to decide. So that those of us who have fled, and we do flee because we know, but that's what the mature do. But what do you do when you're immature? What do you, what do, you do when you haven't been walking with Christ that long? What do you do when you don't know what to do? You just, you just say, Jesus. You can actually just say, Jesus, help me. What do you pray when you don't know what to pray? What do you say to God when you keep doing the very thing you don't want to keep doing over and over and over? Jesus, I made up my mind. This is how I pray. God, make me willing to be made willing. That's, that's how I pray. God, if I'm not willing to do up your good pleasure, right, make me willing to be made willing. I pray one of them prayers. I love whatever's necessary. I don't care what you got to strip me of, Jesus. I don't care what you got to take away from me. I don't care what you have to do to me. Make Linda willing to be made willing because I'm tired of Linda. Y'all ever get sick and tired of yourself? You ever get on your own nerves? <laughs> Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So that requires maturity. And until you mature, stay under this word. Stay under the covering. In the name of Jesus, stay. And get to the point. Listen, we were with a bunch of women yesterday. We had a whole other scripture and something else. But God gave me this revelation. And I need, I know I need to share this. That we kept talking about the woman with the issue of blood. And we all heard that a million times. And I had to ask God, what was the big deal that you turned around because somebody touched you? And that was the big deal. See, this is where we go. Jesus touched me. Jesus, we want Jesus to touch us. And Jesus is waiting for us to touch him. He's waiting. That's the same thing that happened to Ruth when Boaz, when, to, to, to Boaz, when Ruth came at his feet and, and uncovered his feet. And the Bible says he got startled. That's the same thing. She was the bride. It is representative of the bride. Jesus is waiting for the church to touch him. And stop asking the church, touch me, Jesus. Change me, Jesus. Fix me, Jesus. Anoint me, Jesus. Use me, Jesus. And Jesus saying, why don't you touch me? Touch me with your issue. Touch me with your infirmity. Touch me. Come on, I dare you to get so desperate for me that you come to me. It's okay to ask people to go to Jesus for you, but baby... They can't get but so far. Jesus is waiting on you and you and you and you and you and you to touch him for yourself. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Verse 19. I ain't going to be long. So which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. Oh, bless God, bless God. So this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls, your mind, your will, and your emotions. And it leads us through the certain, right there in the place where we desire to get in that holy of holies. And see, we have this great high priest who's already done that for us. 
He has rent the veil. The veil was rent so that we can get in the presence of God. It's not like trying to go see Obama. You ain't got to go through red tape and they ain't got to pat you down and they ain't got to look under your car with a mirror to see if you're bringing in a bomb and dump your purse out and go through your pockets and keep your cell phone. And your days is not like that. You can go directly to Jesus for yourself. Whether you were born again yesterday or yesteryear, you have the authority. Let me say that again. You got the authority to walk up in the presence of the Holy One in a humble attitude, bless God, and present yourself to him a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. But you got to be renewed in your mind. Your mind has to change. Your thought process has to change. You got to get away from some people. You got to put the phone down and stay on Facebook and tweeting and Snapchatting and all of that from time to time and make a sacrifice and get into the presence of God and he will hear the voice of your cry. Even, even David said in Psalm 141, he said, Lord, I cry unto you, make haste. Anybody ever said, he said, make haste. In other words, hurry up, God. Hurry up, Jesus. He said, make haste and hear my voice when I cry unto you. God will make haste. God, when people say you can't hurry God, then what David said, make haste. I'm just saying. He showed up asked. Oh, that thing. Jesus trying to stay with the nose, but I ain't too worried about it. So he's saying that this hope is a strong hope. And what you got to understand is we are in this world like a ship. But the ship has a destination. We have a place we need to go in Jesus. Now, ultimately, it's heaven. But right now, didn't God give you something to do? Didn't he create you for purpose? Doesn't he have some place, something for you to do in the kingdom? People don't understand. Everybody, you don't need a pulpit. God may have called you to do the hair of those who work in the kingdom. He may call you as a mechanic. Oh, my Lord God. He'll call you as a babysitter so that you can anoint somebody's baby and pray over them and teach the word. Praise God. You understand? You got something to do in the kingdom. You can't just keep coming to church and they're not doing anything. You can't just be that way. In other words... You got to grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. So if this is God gives us a new computer, I look at somebody just bought me a new phone. I done stayed up. I was so distracted at work trying to mess with their phone. I mean, I was trying to understand this iPhone. I never had an iPhone. And I'm saying, well, how you turn it off and how you turn it down and how you do this and how you do that? That's how Jesus wants to be in him. That's what he's trying to figure out. Well, what's this mean, Jesus? What are you saying here? Uh-huh. So what does it mean that you're my consolation? What does it mean that you love me with an everlasting love? That's how Jesus wants us to do him. Be just and even more hungry and thirsty for the things of God and you shall be filled. And what I found out is you'll be, you'll be filled with more hunger and more thirst. Praise God. I'm coming to a close. But we're like a ship and a sea in danger of being cast away. And it's sure it's our own nature that we've got to understand that God is trying to break so that we can be these new creation, creations in him. New creatures, new creatures, new creatures, new creatures. And what is this anchor? It is the living word. It is Jesus. It is the gospel. Praise God. He's already gone before us. He's already done the work. He's already done the hard thing. He's the one who hung on the cross. Praise God. Praise God. Verse 20 says this. Whether the forerunner is for us entered. That's Jesus. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Right? And so chapter 10 says, hold on tightly. And I just want to encourage you today to hold on to God's promises. Patiently endure. Think back on those days when you first learned about Jesus and you were excited about him and you were excited about his promise and how you were excited to come to church. You were excited to come to Bible study. You were excited to come to Sunday school. You were excited. You were excited. And so I encourage you today, don't lose your excitement. Don't be double-minded. Don't keep wavering back and forth. Let that man think that he should expect anything of the Lord, James 1 and 8, right? And Acts says, this is the thing. This is what the Bible tells us in Acts in 17 and 28. It's in him that we live. It's in him that we move. And it's in him that I have my being. So when the evil one comes, trying to take you back into a dark place and forget about what God promised you, you make sure you tell the devil, it's in him that I live. It's in him that I move. And it's in him that I have my being. No more wavering. 
No more dialing. You got to ask in faith and you got to surrender. Quitting is not an option. And I don't care what the promise was. I don't care if it was for your children, your marriage, your business, your ministry. If you will endure patiently, God will, will bring that thing to pass and you will obtain the promise of the Lord. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians what 1.15, I believe it is, in 2 Corinthians 1.20, that all of the promises of God are in him what? Yea and amen. If he made you a promise... He's not a man that he should lie. Numbers 23 and 19, neither the son of man that he should repent. If he spoke it, he's going to do it. He made you a promise. God is going to honor his word. He's going to honor his word. So I encourage you to hold on. And in Romans 12, 12, he said, rejoice in your hope. Rejoice, 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 rejoice. Be glad. Be patient in trials and tribulation and continue praying. Bless God. Bless God. We thank God for his word. I encourage you to hold on to his promises. And I do just have, as I'm looking at this one couple and I'm saying, God has something awesome for the two of you to do. The two of you to do together. God's going to use you mightily. Stay in his word. Stay in his teaching. Stay in the Bible studies. Wherever you have to go, in Jesus' mighty name, you stay under the covering and watch God use the two of you. Watch God use you. I know he's going to do it. Couldn't take my eyes off of you. And so we thank God for your hearing the word of the Lord today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. May I pray?